Well, good morning, and welcome aboard. I'm going to be your pilot and tour guide for the next 18 to 20 minutes, and I'm going to be taking you on a flight into this space, inner space. And my mission today is to help you become more self-aware of the power of brain power, your brain power, and the brain power of the people around you, because remember, we don't want to fly alone, and to provide you some tools and insights on removing the barriers to personal productivity. So, uh, are you all willing to engage in an exercise with me? Yes? Okay. So what I'm going to be doing, it's going to go very fast, going to be a lot of fun, and it's voluntary. So I'm going to be showing a series of images with a couple keywords. If you identify with that image, raise your hand and keep it raised. And if you identify with the second image, raise your hand. If you don't, keep your hand out. If you identify the third image, keep your hands up and then stand up. And we want to see how many people it, or how many images, rather, it takes to get everyone up on their feet. Understand? Make sense? Okay, good. Let's begin. How many of you experience overwhelm? One hand up. Oh my gosh. Look, everyone. Woo! Okay, keep your hand up. How many people experience not enough time? Raise the second hand. How many? Okay, I got to explain this one. All right, this is called monkey brain. Some people may not know what monkey brain is, but if you, say, have a cell phone and you're looking at it more than five to seven times a minute or, you know, an hour, and you're texting and you're doing email and you have a hard time focusing, completing single tasks, walk to the other side of the room and when you get there, you have no idea why you're there. You have monkey brain. So if you have monkey brain, stand up. Keep your hands up. Okay. So, so, so look around you. We, we, we share a lot of problems, okay? So the next one is strained relationships. If you have strained relationships and have two hands, go on, stand up. Stay in strained re relationships at home, with workplace people, okay? And what about health concerns? Okay. And then finally, you're worrying about something. That's when you get up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and you break out in a cold sweat and you say, oh my God, what am I doing here? And not being understood by other people. Okay, so, so you can sit down. <laughs> so these are the recognized problems. And I suggest to you that all of these recognized problems are solved by an unrecognized solution, and that's practical neuroscience. Now, I want to ask you a couple quick questions about those uh, recognized problems. Are any of them going to go away on their own? Uh, is using the thinking and behaviors and patterns of the past going to solve them? No. So we need something new. In fact, Einstein's definition of insanity was expecting new outcomes from using the past thinking and behaviors that created uh, those problems. So, if you believe, if you believe even a little bit that there's a connection between what you think and what you experience, I think you're going to really enjoy this flight. So, our flight mantra is change your thinking, change your life. Make sense? Good. <clears throat> so, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you just to read the first four bullets. The first four bullets regarding productivity. Well, it's on the slide. On the slide. And I, it should be on page three as well. Uh, the first four should be uh, should make total sense to you. Agreed. The first four. Now the uh, the last one uh, might be a little counterintuitive. And what it says is cooperation and collaboration versus competition. Okay. And um, 
I'm going to give you the logic as to why cooperation and collaboration is a keystone to solving most of, and if not all, of your problems, and perhaps on a greater and even global scale. So the outcomes from uh, competition are what? Winners and losers. And we've programmed our brain for really hundreds of years and perhaps even thousands of years that competition is essential to survival and growth. The truth is, it's the opposite. It's the exact opposite. Competition is bringing us down. Research, scientific research today and experience and history has shown that a lot more comes out of, a lot more good comes out of collaboration and cooperation than competition. Even the more, most narcissistic and egotistical person you could imagine would agree that he or she will get a lot more of what they want by being a little bit kinder, caring, and saying thank you once in a while and please. So the result of competition in the workplace and at home, and we'll start there, uh, is obvious. We have big egos, we have low self-esteem, we have loss in productivity, we have hurt feelings, we have resentments, we have silos of knowledge, we have crashed relationships. And the benefits and outcomes of collaboration and uh, cooperation is something radically different. People feel safe and supported. They're able to be the best that they can. They feel safe. Productivity and fulfillment comes naturally. And imagine what life would be like in your home and in the workplace if people respected one another's difference, their neural diversity, which we'll go into in a moment, and join their brains, not only their brains, but their hearts to improve the quality of life. So, let's fly over to the alignment process. When people of like mind come together to do something together, these four alignment processes help you fly safely, swiftly, and get you to where you want. Now, the third bullet is probably the one that's most familiar to you. It's skills and competencies. And without it, the plane doesn't fly. And with it, it's not enough because we tend to focus more on skills and competencies. The other three factors, mood state, sensory and cognitive brain strengths, and external environment are the ones that most people miss. That's the practical neuroscience part of it. And that's why productivity is low, morale is low, people make mistakes and become depressed and miserable. So this is where practical neuroscience comes to the rescue. So let's do a quick flyover to mood states. This is the mood elevator. I'll take you through it in a moment. In order to be productive, you must be on the above ground levels in order to be productive. Let me take you through it. In the sub-basement, we have the animal me. That's often referred to as the reptilian state and deals with survival and attacking and defense and things of that nature. The basement level is negative me, feeling bad and having a negative impact on other people. You know what I'm talking about. The above ground is the opposite, which is positive me, feeling good and having a positive effect on other people and the environment. And the penthouse, which is the neocortex, has to do with being the very, very best you can be and is characterized by high levels of productivity, clear thinking, etc. Now, this area here is often called the mammalian brain. It's your emotional system, and that's really a simplified way of looking at emotional intelligence. But to recognize that there's a tipping point, 
in the emotional intelligence to where you're negative on one side and positive on the other. So, a couple quick questions. Where do most people live? What? And some do, yeah, you're right. Do, do, do you recognize that people that you work with and live with sometimes live in the basement? Right, okay. And at what levels do you and your coworkers are the most productive? You need to be above the ground, don't you? You need to be in a positive mood or in that neocortex when you're not worried about things. And what happens when you psych yourself up to be, to put your happy face on your, uh, uh, on your face when you're driving to work and you get to work and it's a negative environment. Does that pull you up or drag you down? It drags you down, exactly. Now the good news is you have greater control over your mood state and the mood state of others and we'll be looking at that in a few moments. So, so we want to take a look at the practical neuroscience of uh, self-awareness, and this is the 40,000-foot view. And uh, neurodiversity is what makes you unique. What makes you unique like a snowflake. And we're going to be, we're going to be starting with sensory strengths. We have three primary ways of taking in information. We have auditory, and less than 8% of the world's population is auditory. We've been collecting statistics for nearly 21 years now, but yet how do we communicate? So the reason this is a green hat is because when you meet an auditory, it's your lucky day, because the auditories will listen and hear things you won't hear, and they'll pick up tones of voice, and they ask great questions. <clears throat> the other one, we'll do this one here, is visual. Visual people like to what? See and observe. And they like, they're very, very good at uh, spreadsheets and seeing errors and proofreading and things of this nature. And that represents about 40% of the population. Surprisingly, the biggest percentage of the poor population is kinesthetics. And kinesthetics like to uh, take in information by moving and touching, and they're the ones fidgeting around and going crazy in a meeting and taking pens apart and tapping them and looking like they're, you know, need to escape. <laughs> and they're the, they're the folks that are very good at hands-on and operational kind of things. So these three hats, these three hats form six different sequences. And what's important is everyone has a primary and a secondary modality. And doesn't it make sense that when you're taking in information, you're going to get it faster if it comes in through your primary and secondary modality? And doesn't it make sense, too, that when you're working in the work environment, that your strengths align with the way your brain is wired. So how well would someone who has a very low score in auditory do at a telemarketing job where it requires listening? You get the idea. So let's move to the other side. Animals have that. Humans have that. Animals do not have this. This is the cognitive side. This is what distinguishes the humans from the animals. So this is what separates us. So we have the ability to make sense of sensory information. And we have sequential thinking. Okay, we have sequential thinking that has to do with logic and order and sequence and processes and content and realism and budgets and things of that nature, very, very, very important. And we also have global people who like to live in the world of uh, possibilities and options, big picture thinking, imagination, often considered by some as dreamers. 
And then we also have people who are very strong in both, called integrated, who could reach out and understand both the sequential point of view and the global point of view. So, so we have the... Now blind spots. Blind spots are what you pay least attention to. So just to give two quick examples, how would you like to hire a brain surgeon who was, whose blind spot was visual? Boop. How did that happen? Wow, wow, how did that happen? <clears throat> or, whew, lost my eyes. Or, would you want to hire a cost accountant whose blind spot was sequential thinking and accuracy? And yet, how many people work primarily in their blind spots in the workplace. So one of the key learning points here is that to improve productivity, you want to align work with people's strengths, not their weaknesses. Now, remember, remember that Self-awareness of neurodiversity begins with you, but also remember that other people have it too. Work team, spouse, friends, customers. So there's a respect element in this, and that's one of the reasons why we have low productivity is people don't respect each other's strengths and spend a lot of wasted time arguing about nothing. <clears throat> okay. Now, I want to suggest to you that you can choose your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Because your thoughts definitely affect your mood and your attitude, and it affects those around you. And that's where it ties into the mood elevator. So our choices fall into two categories. We have high road behaviors, and we have low road behaviors. Let's take the low road first. Low road behaviors are driven by fear and ignorance. The beliefs are similar to people are lazy and stupid. Where there's a whip, there's a way. People should just be happy to have a job and hunker down and tell them what I'm and, and do what I tell them to do. That's low road behaviors. They also include complaining, criticizing, judging, whining, dictatorial practices, and being uncaring and unkind. Under this environment, can anyone be productive? On the other hand, so here are some of the images for the low road. Now let's move into the high road. Now it's driven by respect, respect for the uniqueness and gifts of people. A good behavior is to align people's sensory strengths and cognitive strengths with what they have to do. Using kind and caring words like, please, thank you, forgive me, I have a problem, I need your help. What can I do to give you a hand? So it also means suspending judgment and creating a safe and supportive environment whereby everyone can be the very, very best that they can be. So let's move on to the summary. <clears throat> so, before we land, um, let's review where we've been. Number one, uh, aligning people's sensory and cognitive strengths with what has to be done will get more things done in less time with fewer mistakes. Cooperation and collaboration are engendered by high road behaviors, not low road. And this creates a very, very sustainable environment where everyone can be the best that they can be. 
It also makes for more productive people because they're having more fun and they're experiencing less stress. So alignment means more than just productivity. It, it, it also means improving quality of life. And when you improve quality of life, everyone gains. <clears throat> there are no losers. There can be no losers. So what I'm suggesting is change our thinking about competition and the way we're doing things, and everything will shift. So I hope, I really, really hope you're as excited as I am about the promises of practical neuroscience as the unrecognized solution to some of the things that you raised your hand to. Because a lot of interpersonal relationships problems occur because people communicate on different wavelengths. What do you think if happens when someone very highly sequential is communicating with someone highly global. It has nothing to do with values or ideas, it's how they're processing it. And it'll be like two ships passing in the night. But when they know what each other's respective strengths are, they compensate for each other's blind spots and they become dynamic duos in life. And that can be extended not only in the family, but also into the workplace. Now, before, oh, here's the promises of practical neuroscience. <clears throat> Please read them. And before you go back, or when you get back, rather, to your office or your home, um, I'd ask you to take a look at brainpathways.net. I'm going to point out just a couple things. <clears throat> On the very top, there's a, there's a portal to learn how your brain is wired, to process information, how to leverage it and avoid mid-air collisions with your blind spots. Sign up for the bra free brain uh, messages from your brain. There's a blog with 98 articles, including the mood elevator, the seven principles of successful neural leaders the three golden rules of communication success, and then on the bottom, there are some links up with a lot of free resources. So I've enjoyed being your pilot and tour guide. I thank you very, very much. And I hope I've kept within the time. <clears throat>